uh, will be held, which will be held by Tehran University of Medical Sciences in association with Cancer Institute Hospital. Uh, and also I would like to thank Appraise to Raise team to support this program technically. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Professor Keith Hunter uh, from Liverpool University. And I think Professor Hunter, you are with us. Hello. Good morning, uh, Dr. Puyan. Good to see you, good to be with you. Thank you for accepting my invitation. And it's a, a great pleasure for us to have uh, Dr. Nazanin Mahdavi as moderator in this panel. And also I would like to thank Dr. Mir Keshavars. Mahsa, are you with us? Mahsa, do you have my voice? Could you turn on your cam and also hello. Oh, hello. Hello. Great. Good to see you again. And also, it's a great pleasure for me that we have uh, Professor Merva with us and also Dr. Mandana. It's great pleasure. And I hope we would have a great hello. We would have a great discussion on this challenging topic. Uh, uh, about odontogenic lesions. Uh, Dr. Mirke Shawars will present a valuable um, uh, article uh, which focuses on pitfalls in odontogenic lesions and tumors, a practical guide uh, which, we, uh, which had been published by Professor Hunter and also Sven Nicklander. Uh, okay. Dr. Mirke Shawars, we are all ears for your presentation. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this rural club. Could you share your PowerPoint? Great. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this journal club. I'm Max Menu Keshavas, oral and maxillofacial pathologist, and head of the oral pathology department and faculty at Zanjan University of Medical Science in Iran. I'm going to present an article uh, titled Pitfalls in Odontogenic Lesions and Tumors, a practical guide that published. Uh, um, published by Dr. Kate Hunter. Uh, hello, dear Dr. Hunter, welcome to this club, and Dr. Sven Nicklander. His presentation about lesion arising from odontogenic tissues of the gels very, uh, from very common to very rare, some such as radicular cysts from a routine part of the diagnostic workload for histopathologists who report specimens from the head and neck, but many other lesions are rarely seen and cause significant diagnostic difficulty for the non-specialists. Uh, this will focus on, the, uh, on practical advice to help um, avoid the pitfalls in the diagnosis of odontogenic lesions. Uh, please pay attention to the first pitfall about lesions with immature dentitions. The dentition starts to develop around week six in intrauterine life. The development of teeth requires both an epithelial component and uh, an ectomesenchymal component. The epithelial component arises from a structure in the developing oral epithelium called primary epithelial band. The ectomesenchymal component originating from cells of the neural crest. This epithelial and mesenchymal remnants give rise to the full range of odontogenic lesions and tumors. Many odontogenic hematomas and tumors recapitulate the histological appearances of tooth development to some degree. For example, the development of odontoma is a particular case in point, or amylobelastoma closely resembles the enamel organ. 
or odontogenic myxoma vary by recapitulate features of the dental follicle or dental papilla. There is potential for confusion of immature odontogenic tissues with odontogenic neoplasts, and this is a well-known pitfall in younger patients. It means smaller than 20 years, particularly before completion of the dentition. Dental lamina rests in tissues overlying on erupted teeth. Dental lamina commonly found in gingival biopsies, particularly from the posterior mandible. They vary markedly in their appearance as small clusters of cells, very similar to the dental lamina, to larger islands of epithelium, which occasion can show a squamous metaplasia. There is potential if the dental lamina rests are extensive for confusion with amyloblastoma, particularly peripheral type, but dental lamina rests uh, tend not to present with a follicular histological pattern, and the clinical and radiological features show no um, convincing lesion. Dependent on the stage of development, either the dental papilla or a dental follicle can have a similar histological features to an odontogenic myxoma. As the dentition matures, the dental follicle can enlarge, uh, often with a radiograph, a provisional diagnosis of a dentinary cyst. Uh, if the biopsy consists of the fibromyxoid tissue, the presence of the structures suggestive of developing tooth. For example, fragments of reduced enamel epithelium can be helpful. However, in most cases, careful attention to the clinical details and review of the radiographs will resolve this issue. Odontoma or hamartomatous lesions, which arise from both odontogenic epithelium and mesenchyma, and also contain dental heart tissues. This mixture of a disorganized dental epithelium and mesenchyme can cause confusion between a developing odontoma and a number of trinoplastic lesions, such as amyloblastic fibroma and amyloblastic fibroodontoma. Identification of such a histological dif uh, differential diagnosis, again, require careful consideration of the clinical, in particular, the age of patient and presentation and radiological features before arriving at the final diagnosis. The next pitfall is about incomplete or misleading uh, clinical details or radiology. It is important to build good relationships with radiology colleagues who are experienced in assessing gel lesions as in many other areas of histo histology, much of uh, information uh, requires to make the diagnosis comes in the uh, form of clear and complete clinical information and correct um, interpretation of uh, ancillary tests such as radiological examinations. Clinical history is very important in inflamed lesion, uh, which contain squamous epithelium. For example, a history of non-vital tools and a periapical radiolucency makes the assessment in this issue much more straightforward. Similarity in lesions must often associated with higher molar teeth, defining whether the tooth is uh, unerupted or uh, partially erupted, gives useful information for refining histological differential diagnosis. The importance of access to radiographs is very powerful. Review of the clinical and radiological features of 101 and dentigerous cysts reported by Bennett uh, identified five misdiagnoses for odontogenic keratosis and one amyloblastoma. Thus, review of the radiology uh, should be undertaken in all cystic lesions of the gels uh, is very reasonable. Uh, please uh, attention them, uh, to the next pitfall about amyloblastoma, small biopsies, and variable uh, appearances. Amyloblastoma is the commonest odontogenic tumor, and in many cases, the classic histological appearances, follicular or plexiform patterns or both, provide little difficulty in diagnosis to those with some experience of tumor. However, a general histo histopathology setting, even classic histology of a rare tumor can extract fear into an experienced pathologist. 
it is wise to seek opinion of colleagues who have more experience in odontogenic lesions in order to improve confidence in uh, their diagnosis. A number of side types of amyloblastoma can cause difficulties, particularly in small biopsies, um, small biopsies uh, such as uh, acantomatous, granular, granular, and basaloid types, and viscoblastic amyloblastoma, and also tumor containing clear cell and mucus cells. In the smoplastic amyloblastoma, the islands of odontogenic epithelium can be very compressed and attenuated or irregular pointed islands set in hyalinized the active fibroblastic stroma. Mixoid changes may be present against the, to the epithelial islands and metaplastic one may be identified. Other odontogenic lesions may contain amyloblastic like epithelium. These are shown in this table. For example, amyloblastic fibroma. In most cases, other histological features allow for distinction uh, from amyloblastoma. Tumors which contain both odontogenic epithelium and mesenchyme include amyloblastic fibroma and amyloblastic fibroodontoma. In these cases, careful attention must be paid to the uh, mesenchyme component. In amyloblastoma, this is natural fibrous tissue, whereas in amyloblastic fibroma, this is an immature cellular stroma, which resembles the dental papilla. Despite often being large lesions, biopsies can be very small. This is particularly issue with lesions which uh, are uh, predominantly cystic. Biopsies are usually taken in the mass accessible site, which is commonly an area of expansion in the posterior mandible. Often, this may only provide a small biopsy of cystic lining with features um, which are difficult to interpret. It is not possible to definitive uh, diagnosis. There are a number of uh, pointers to amyloblastoma, including features uh, shown um, in this slide, uh, but on occasion, it is not possible to uh, definitively resolve a uh, differential diagnosis of a developmental cyst, such as the dentigerous cyst or uh, odontogenic cyst or uh, amyloblastoma or a small biopsy. And it is uh, reasonable to request a um, further, um, larger biopsy. Care must be taken before arriving at a final diagnosis of a unicystic amyloblastoma. This variant, which comprises a single cyst space, uh, often molecular or radiology, with or uh, without proliferation into the cyst moment, probably has a much lower recurrence rate than conventional amyloblastoma. The pitfall comes in misdiagnosis a predominantly cystic conventional amyloblastoma, uh, where very little solid component is present or indeed if the solid component has been missed in the biopsy. At this final diagnosis, the whole specimen should be examined for the absence or presence of solid islands of tumor in the cystic wall. It is not possible to make a definitive diagnosis on an incisional biopsy. I thank you for attention until now. I'm looking forward to uh, hear from dear Dr. Shachi. Uh, hi, Nazanin. Do you have my voice? Could you please get us started, the... Dr. Mahdavi? Yes, I have your voice. Can you Dr. hear Mahdavi, me? Do you have my... Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi, and good afternoon from Tehran. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our dear colleagues who attend this meeting and also Dr. Uh, Mahsa for her uh, kind, pre uh, nice presentation. So we have decided to uh, divide this session into three blocks. And in the first three, uh, in the first uh, uh, block, we will have uh, a discussion about the first three pitfalls. So, uh, Professor Hunter, is there anything you want to add? Any comments? 
I don't think there's anything particularly that um, Dr. Massa has not covered from the paper. I think in these um, this areas that have been discussed already, I think there are a number of very important take home messages. And there's a, a very interesting paper uh, which was published many, many years ago um, as part of an AFIP review of um, lesions in the, uh, the dentition of, of younger patients. Uh, and one of these showed uh, that there was quite a significant amount of overdiagnosis of neoplastic lesions in younger patients. And particularly, there was confusion about um, the appearance of the dental papilla and the dental follicle. There's a lot of confusion related to them. And so there were lesions in the jaws, which um, were part of the spectrum of the developing dentition, which were with some regularity being diagnosed as odontogenic myxomas. And I think this is where it's very important to draw together the strands of care of what you would say and how you assess lesions in children and also the importance of the integrity of the clinical information and having access to the radiology. And bringing that, these things together, I think, makes for a basis for, for safe diagnosis and not over-diagnosing. Because when you think about the difference in terms of the potential for treatment of something which is merely, a, um, let's say, an expanded dental follicle, in comparison to the treatment which may be proposed for an odontogenic myxoma, these are drastic differences in terms of how they might be treated. And particularly when we're talking about pediatric patients, that's very significant. So care needs to be taken very much in bringing these things together. And I always teach our trainees that if you are wanting to call something a neoplasm, an odontogenic neoplasm in a child, you should always stop and ask yourself, is that right? It may be on occasion that it is right because we do see true odontogenic neoplasms in children, but they are far more likely to be part of the spectrum of the developing dentition. And you do need to stop yourself and ask that you have checked everything properly before you make that definitive diagnosis. So that's probably all I would say, particularly in relation to uh, the initial sections that have already been presented. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, making a differential diagnosis between uh, immature dentition and the two. I know that you never differentiate plastic fiber odontoma from um, developing odontoma, yes? Can you tell us a bit about how to differentiate these two from each um, this is very difficult, and I think I'll probably bring Dr. Merva into this discussion at this point as well, because she has done quite a lot of work on this. I actually have a current um, referral, a, a consult case on a nine-year-old boy in a lesion which has been sent. Um, and the histology it came out um, from the patient as um, fragments uh, of tissue surrounding the crown of a tooth. And in the material that I have, it's classic ameloblastic fibroma. But of course, again, you do have to stop and say, OK, what really is the clinical presentation of this? When we're looking at the radiology, is this a lesion which is surrounding the crown of an unerupted tooth? Is there actually a clinically expansile lesion here that we have to think is it acting in a neoplastic manner? Um, and so I, I've, I've had access to the radiology for this case, and there is an unerupted lower first premolar and associated. And this lesion, which is classic ameloblastic fibroma, is just surrounding the crown of this uninterrupted tooth. There is a little bit of expansion and there is displacement of the crown of the tooth. And so this brings a very interesting discussion of, despite the fact that there is no evidence of any dental hard tissue formation in this case, what do we say about it in terms of a diagnosis? Am I going to want to call this an ameloblastic fibroma or on balance of probability, given the age of the patient at nine years of age, given the site of the lesion, which is pericoronal, is this just a developing odontome in which there has not yet been inductive formation of dental hard tissue? And that can be very difficult at times. And I have, in this case, because my, my own bias is to tend 
if in doubt in children not to call them neoplasms unless there is very good neo evidence for that, I tend to call them developing odontomes. But this is a very controversial area and I would be very happy to have Merva's comments on this. Uh, and I think we need to be very sensible in, in terms of how we approach diagnosis in these lesions. Thank you very much, Professor Hunter Meva. Can you please share your opinion with us? Hi. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, thank you so much for this great uh, journal club and the great paper for the uh, Kit Hunter and also nice presentation from doctor. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with uh, all the say the kids say. Uh, but what I do in my practice, especially I use the diagnostic algorithm, of course, with the clinical and radiological features is the first, then the histopathological features. Especially what I look at the, uh, as histopathological features, uh, the amyloblastic fibroma like stroma. Uh, should be no architecture. And it's also showed some uh, stromal hypercellularity. And of course, dentin and animal production should be present within the proliferating amyloblastic fibroma like soft tissue. If I see some ghost cells, uh, cyst like structures, cementum, quartz, uh, strands of amyloblastic epithelium in a mature but loose connective tissue lobulated structure, uh, hypercellular uh, areas only around the epithelium and ordered dental heart tissue production. At that time, my diagnosis uh, just uh, will be the de developing odontoma. This is the, maybe the most important histopathological feature which I uh, look at under the micro uh, microscope. But uh, especially for the clinical and radiological features, um, just uh, kids said, uh, Dr. Verit and uh, myself made a very large study about the developing odontomas and the amyloblastic fibrodontomas. So we just found that the larger lesions, uh, which means that uh, 2.1 centimeters in diameter, and in young patients, which is means uh, under the uh, 13 years, at that time, this. Uh, clinical features may help to give the diagnosis of amyloblastic fibrodontoma. But if either histopathologic findings nor the age science clues do not have the differential diagnosis, exit diagnosis at that time, please uh, keep the diagnosis as developing odontoma uh, to uh, avoid the old diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you very much for your explanation. And I think we can continue uh, with the pitfalls, uh, Dr. Mikesh Abbas. Sorry, may, may I ask a question? Oh, of course, please. <laughs> I had a question about the third pitfall about amyloblastoma. It, uh, I would like to ask Professor Hunter, how do you sign out uh, the diagnosis, um, the lesions with diagnosis of unicystic amyloblastoma. Do you differentiate uh, um, the mural type from other types uh, of the um, unicystic amyloblastoma? As you know, it is very important for the clinicians how to manage unicystic amyloblastoma. Uh, and how do you sign out these lesions? So uh, thank you, Puyan, and, and I think that's a very important point to make in this case. And, and I will emphasize the point again that in terms of making the diagnosis of unicystic amyloblastoma, that it can only be made on a complete specimen. You cannot make a diagnosis of a unicystic amyloblastoma on an incisional biopsy. But as far as, um, I, I guess in many ways, I use the concept of mural islands in unicystic amyloblastoma solely as a descriptive entity. I would sign these out as my bottom line as conventional amyloblastoma. 
you know, I, and I think you know there's a there's a lot of argument going. On, and I I did a a webinar for a um, a maxillofacial surgery group in France a few weeks ago where we were talking about various aspects of the surgical management of these. And I think the approach to management um, is a completely different discussion. Uh, and the I think there are there's a good discussion to be had about whether we over treat some of these ameloblastomas or not. But nonetheless, I think that the evidence is there to state that we should be communicating to our surgical colleagues that a, a largely cystic ameloblastoma that does have mural ends is, if, is in effect a conventional ameloblastoma and needs to be treated in that way. Uh, great. Uh, um, sorry, but I, 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 it means that you are in um, um, in touch with your surgeons at your center, and um, um, you know that uh, uh, you, you you explain that uh, they treat uh, the um, uh, unicystic amyloblastoma uh, mural type as a conventional amyloblastoma solid type. Yeah, I think. We're moving to a point in the UK where I, I think we're we're moving away from saying that, you know, a blanket rule being if you have a conventional ameloblastoma, you need a segmental resection. And we are very much moving to individually discussing the patients. And it's important in terms of the size and where the ameloblastoma is and what the potential we think for recurrence is. I mean, for example, in lesions in the posterior maxilla, we know that that is a real challenge, a real challenge for us histologically, but it's also a real challenge for the surgeons in order to get proper clearance of that. And I think there is a tendency to, to look at the patient's needs and, and so we're not saying that, you know, in every case where you have mural islands in a, in, in a unicystic ameloblastoma, that the patient's going to get a segmental mandibulectomy. I think, I think we're past that period of time, but it requires really good communication. I think in both of this, the large surgical centers that I have worked, the surgeons who would largely do the uh, treatment of patients who have odontogenic tumors, I know very well. We discuss individual patients. We do, the, the surgeon and the pathologist have a discussion individually about the patient and what the treatment strategy for that should be. And in many cases, we actually take our odontogenic, our large odontogenic tumors to a cancer multidisciplinary team for, it's effectively a complex benign um, multidisciplinary team where they are discussed in essentially the same detail as the patients who are having cancer resections are so that that treatment can be tailored exactly to the circumstance of the patient. Great, thank you. And I would like to add a question from the audience that is uh, the incisional biopsy enough to make a diagnosis of amyloblastic carcinoma and um, and or you would prefer to postpone the diagnosis to the excisional biopsy? How do you think about it? Um, I think I have to say, well, that depends. If in the biopsy you have sufficient evidence, if you have um, cytological significant cytological atypia, if you have necrosis, if you have the classic histological features of of malignancy, I think that you are it is possible to make a diagnosis of an ameloblastic carcinoma in an incisional biopsy. But my experience of that is far, it is, it is more complex and more nuanced than that. Now, very often, the diagnosis of um, making a diagnosis of an ameloblastic carcinoma is difficult. Uh, it's done in large lesions where there are sampling problems. And sometimes, particularly if there's been a pre-existing ameloblastoma, you get areas which look ameloblastoma-like and a little unusual, but are difficult actually to make the definitive diagnosis of ameloblastic carcinoma. So very, it very much depends on what you get in your biopsy. Um, and I think that in many cases for, you know, for example, for maxillary ameloblastomas, where we know that there is a certain element of crowding and so on that is quite often part of the spectrum of benign ameloblastoma in the maxilla, it is really very important to be quite careful in approaching these biopsies and, and not to overstate what you actually genuinely can do from the biopsy that you have in front of you. Great, thank you very much. Sorry for interruption. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we can continue uh, with the rest of the article, Dr. Massa.
Massa, can you hear me? Hello again. Yes, we can continue. My test slide is not shown. Uh, we can see your PowerPoint. You can go ahead. Next challenging is in the diagnosis of odontogenic lesions, which have overlapping or common features with other lesions. Common histological features are the presence of mucous cells and keratinization in cystic lesions. Bowels are common and arise a number of interesting differential diagnoses. Both cells are also seen in a range of odontogenic lesions, but these are much less frequent. Mucous cells are a common finding in a range of odontogenic lesions. In some, they are a carrier diagnostic features, whilst in others, uh, they are a metaplastic phenomenon. The main lesion that is a character, uh, characteristic by mucous cells is the glandular odontogenic cyst. The cyst um, has overlapping with plasma periodontal cyst, botryoid cyst, and occasion with a central mucoidermoid carcinoma. Glandular odontogenic cyst present variable histological features, uh, including the cilia hubmet surface cells and the blood like uh, thickening of the cyst lining. But it is the presence of mucous cells and uh, multiple cystic spaces um, uh, which overlap with uh, intraosseous mucoidermoid carcinoma and may concerns. Assessment of um, ML fusion rearrangement has been suggested as a possible tool for uh, differentiating these lesions. However, uh, whilst the presence of um, ML 2 rearrangement allows the diagnosis of intraosseous mucoepidermoid carcinoma to be made, uh, the converse is not necessary is true. Uh, absence of the translocation does not exclude a diagnosis of intraosseous mucoidermoid carcinoma. In such cases, arriving at a different diagnosis can be very challenging. The distribution of lesion can be helpful. Glandular odontogenic cysts, often anterior gel, uh, intraosseous mucoidermoid carcinoma, more common in posterior gel. And the presence of symptoms are uh, much more common in um, intraosseous mucoidermoid carcinoma may be useful, uh, but a range of experience opinion should be uh, solved in, in some cases. Mucous cells are also identify, uh, identified in a number of other lesions, focally in odontogenic um, cysts. Uh, this uh, figure is shown. Uh, radicular cysts, residual cysts, and even an occasion in amyloblastoma. These are uh, most likely uh, metaplastic in origin and uh, are part of the spectrum of uh, appearances in these lesions. The significance is not known uh, and uh, they require uh, no further attention, unless extensive, when other differential diagnoses come into play. Keratinization is also very common in odontogenic lesions. This is mass uh, obvious in the odontogenic keratosis with its uh, characteristic parakeratinized uh, lining and basal surface saving. This is rarely classic uh, diagnostic difficulty, except when uh, there is a um, coincident inflammation. In this situation, the characteristic feature of the lining are lost and may only be uh, present focally with the rest resembling an inflammatory odontogenic cyst. This may require careful examination of the whole specimen if uh, odontogenic keratosis is a consideration clinically. Keratinization may be present focally in the about uh, one part of odontogenic cysts, including dentigerous cysts and radicular cysts. Keratinization uh, is almost never present in very inflamed cysts. Next, pitfall, uh, pitfall five, about uh, mixoid lesions. 
A mixed histological appearance in tissues can arise for a number of reasons, and a mixed extracellular matrix has been recognized in reactive and neoplastic lesions. Such as appearance may be due to an accumulation of glucose aminoglycan and hyaluronic acid. And um, in uh, many body sites, this is considered a, a degenerative phenomenon. A staining uh, characteristic in uh, H and E are a loose, pale staining eosinophilic to gray color in the connective tissues. Classically, this appearance is seen in odontogenic lipsoma, a rare mesenchymal tumor of gels, most common in the mandible. Mixoid changes um, in other lesions is also common. Clinical and radiological information is very useful in this distinction. For example, a lack of small nerves uh, means by negative S100 staining in dental follicles may be useful. Mixoid degeneration is also seen in nerve sheath tumors. This can be problematic uh, because a proportion of uh, odontogenic mixomas do express S100. A range of mixed lesion express uh, alpha SMA um, on occasion a mixed appearance can be seen in a um, reactive gingival lesion such as a fibrous, a police or focal mucinosis. Uh, that presents of a differential diagnosis with a pulta extensive or odontogenic mesoma. Careful clinical and radiological correlation may help in distinguishing um, these cases. Uh, thank you for attention. Until now, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hear from uh, Dr. Mahdavi. Uh, thank you very much um, for the presentation. Well, I have a question, which is one of my problems in the diagnosis of dentigerous cysts. You know, sometimes you see some dentigerous cysts that uh, they have a lot of mucous cells, uh, some areas with ciliated cells that somehow appear as, uh, you know, have a hobnail appearance. The epithelium is usually thick, thin, but in some areas you can see a, a kind of thickening in the epithelium. Not the classic feature of nodular thickening or uh, plaque-like thickening, but it's thickened in some areas. So my question is, uh, is there any key feature to differentiate dentigerous cysts from, uh, from glandular odontogenic cysts? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And it's, at times that can be um, a very difficult diagnosis to make. And I think if I, I would go back to the whole thing, which is the premise, I think, which is the most important take home message that the histology always needs to be interpreted in view of the clinical and the radiographic appearance. I think, as, as a saying that we have, you know, uh, uh, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. So, you know, and for dentigerous cysts, and again, this may well be very dependent upon your communication with your surgeon, having a, a nice friendly tame maxillofacial surgeon who will actually tell you what the findings were at operation and confirm that this lesion that you have actually was in a true dentigerous relationship with the tooth if you did not receive the tooth with the lesion. And so that is very helpful. But of course, that's not the reality of what you get all the time. You know, and these are can, can then be very difficult. Glandular odontogenic cysts, I don't know, the point being made about mucous cells in, in dentigerous cysts, I, I, to my experience, it is relatively common and vocally cilia as well. Uh, and this just could, it shows to me the, the beauty of odontogenic epithelium and how plastic, how divergent in terms of its patterns of differentiation that it is. Um, but there are times, particularly again, when you get a small biopsy and you wonder, you know, am I actually getting true gland formation into the epithelium? And at times that can be really very challenging. And there are some very rare times that I have actually had to just sign these out as a differential diagnosis that I, in the material that I have and the clinical information I have, I, I cannot make the call. 
Um, and I think in that case, you're then down to the surgeon to be able to interpret that in terms of what they found at operation. And if this was a lesion which was in true dentigerous relationship with the tooth, well, then in effect, I would say that it is a dentigerous cyst. Um, does that answer your question? It doesn't really give you an absolutely definitive answer because I think in in all circumstances, that is not an easy distinction to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Dr. Shakib, is there any question or uh, comment you want to add? Yes, I had a question about assessment of mammal 2 gene rearrangement to differentiate uh, glandular odontogenic cyst from uh, mucoepidermoid cyst. It's very uh, important to differentiate these two lesions because of trabeutic approach. Uh, do, you, do you routinely um, do this, assess this um, gene rearrangement in your center uh, because we don't have the facilities and also the, uh, we cannot do this uh, to, uh, we cannot assess uh, these rearrangement in our center. What do you think about? The circumstances in which I would do that are very limited, to be mm -hmm. honest. You know, and again, it is the circumstance of a small biopsy where there is no, we're not really in the, the area of discussing whether this is a dentigerous cyst or not. There is a radiolucency in the mandible very often at the retromolar area angle of mandible which has a significant population of of mucus cells in it and so you look at it you, the one thing that would come to mind is is this a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma and so so that is, is the circumstance in which i would do that I mean, um the paper which you know you're, you're referring to and i've quoted it is um, a paper by one of my dear colleagues, Liz, Elizabeth Billadou from University of Pittsburgh, who has looked at this um, and looked at you know what population of lesions do, do do have this abnormality, and it is something which can only properly, in my mind, be done by use of fluorescence into hybridization, which is not something that everybody has access to. Um, we have had experience of trying to use the antibody, of course, that the, the end result of that gene rearrangement is that you get a fusion protein, which means that you should be able to raise antibodies to it and, and look for the fusion protein by immunohistochemistry. But our experience, certainly when I was in Sheffield, is that the antibodies which have been raised against the fusion protein are, are really not very good and are not fit for diagnostic purpose. So unless you have the facilities for um, doing fluorescence in situ hybridization, um, it is not something that you can, and the circumstances I think in which it is genuinely necessary are extraordinarily limited. I don't think it's anything that you should really concern yourself about. And but there may be the odd case here in there where you have to say, well, then the differential diagnosis is this, you know, and, and you you then just have to discuss with the surgeons what the way forward for the for the patient is. Exactly, exactly. I do agree. Great comment. I, I think uh, Merva has a comment on uh, differentiating dentigerous cyst from glandular odontogenic cyst. Uh, uh, Merva, could you please explain your comment? I think it is very important to, uh, for you to uh, um, differentiate these two lesions based on the gross examination of the specimen. Uh, both cross examination and of course the radiological examination. Uh, if I really see an, an, an erupted tooth uh, with the the uh, crown of the tooth, I really uh, most of the time uh, prefer to give the dentigerous cyst instead of uh, glandular odontogenic cyst diagnosis. In my experience, just I think that my glandular odontogenic cyst uh, diagnosis, I think we haven't got any embedded tooth kit. Do you have any glandular odontogenic cysts with embedded tooth? No. In my experience, what the diagnosis that I make glandular odontogenic cysts would be without a tooth. And that's why I say it's very important that you think, you know, if, if, if clinically and radiographically it's coming as a dentigerous, that is the diagnosis that you should be using. And I, I entirely agree with you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Okay, great, thank you. I think we have uh, also Dr. Mondana and Dr. Raghu uh, 
uh, here with us. And if you would have any comments, uh, we welcome you all to contribute to this discussion. Uh, okay. I think uh, this is time to go to this uh, third part presentation. Massa, are you, are you with us? Massa? Do you have my, okay, okay. Let's go ahead. Next pitfall is about tumors containing clear cells. Clear cells may be identified in a wide range of odontogenic lesions and are mostly regarded as a degenerative phenomenon. A number of metastatic tumors also may contain clear cells, uh, such as renal cell carcinoma, salivary gland tumors, and melanoma. Tumors contain clear cells have a range of biological um, behaviors. Albeit most clear cell lesions in the jaws don't uh, demonstrate significant cytological atypia, even if malignant. Clear cell variants of calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumors have been reported and often um, total sum differential diagnosis with odontogenic malignancies containing clear cells. Clear cell odontogenic carcinoma is the most significant diagnosis in this part uh, that commonly um, occurs in the posterior mandible of the recur locally and can metastasis. Thus, um, this is important to mark through the differential diagnosis systemically, uh, PAS with, uh, and without uh, diastase and uh, mucin uh, stain, alcium blue or, uh, or mucicarmin uh, are the starting point uh, to rule out mucin or glycogen accumulation. Clear cell malignancies from many parts of body have been demonstrated uh, to contain um, EWSR1 gen rearrangement. And this has been demonstrated in clear cell odontogenic carcinoma. Immunohistochemistry can be used to differential diagnosis, such as the RCC and CD10 for renal cell carcinoma and the S100 and melana A in melanoma. The last pitfall is about assessment of malignancy in odontogenic tumors. The assessment of malignancy in uh, odontogenic uh, tumors uh, is uh, in some cases uh, straightforward uh, if a uh, destructive tumor shows uh, the classic histological features of malignancy. Nuclear and uh, cellular polymorphism, a uh, high mitotic rate with abnormal mitosis and uh, areas of necrosis. In many cases, these features are not so clear cut. In particular, solid amyloblastoma in the maxilla tend to show increased, and this is a worry, the crowding, the overlapping, and the body, and these are not necessarily indicators of malignancy in this tumor. But the clinical features have been associated with malignancy of amyloblastoma or um, the older patients uh, starting the maxilla and larger tumors, uh, but these features um, are of limited use in the assessment of malignancy in individual cases. Use of a KIM67 to assess the proliferation retraction may help. The current other's view is that a KI67 expression in more than 20% of cells is very suggestive of malignancy. Other biomarkers, such as a high expression of SUX2 and OT4, have been suggested for use in um, distinguishing solid amyloblastoma and amyloblastoma carcinoma. Prominent nuclear polymorphism, bizarre atypia um, are often identified in a calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. This feature is part of the pathological spectrum of appearances of uh, calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. Not uh, that increased uh, mitosis and abnormal mitosis are absent. Conclusion. Due to their relative rarity, odontogenic lesions 
whether reactive, non-mental, or non-elastic can cause um, diagnostic uncertainty. Uh, in many cases, taking uh, the time to explore the clinical and radiological features of the lesions will be very helpful in arriving at uh, diagnosis. Okay, thank you for attention. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, please let me get started this section with a, a question. Uh, Professor Hunter, what do you think about the CD10 uh, antibody to make a diagnosis of uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma? Uh, in fact, uh, um, in my experience, I prefer to use PAX8 instead of CD10. And I think the nuclear positivity of PAX8 might be more reliable than CD10, but in most um, references and textbooks, uh, CD10 is uh, introduced as a, a diagnostic marker to make a diagnosis of um, uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would agree with you. And I think it just reflects to some extent um, exactly how long ago it is that Sven and I wrote the paper you know, in terms of my own diagnostic practice. Um, you know, using the PAX genes um, and uh, CD10 and RCC, uh, I, I would use a variety of them to, to, to look at that. I mean, my experience of RCC as an antibody is not very good. I don't think it's particularly specific, to be honest. And sometimes, you know, in, in lesions which have been diagnosed as renal cell carcinoma, it can be negative. So, no, I, I, I take your point. I, I agree entirely. Yeah. But I say it reflects the fact that, that Sven and I probably drafted this up about five years ago, you know, and our, and our diagnostic practice would be slightly different now. Okay, and, and the clear cell carcinomas of the jaw are very challenging, you know, mm -hmm. and especially differentiating uh, the uh, clear cell odontogenic carcinoma from um, clear cell carcinoma origi originating from salivary gland. Uh, tissue. Uh, is there any difference between these two lesions uh, regarding treatment plan? Uh, do you have any experience? No, there, there doesn't appear to be. And it's, it's a very inter because they're a very interesting group of lesions because regardless of their histogenesis, they all seem to have the consistent molecular background of abnormalities in EWSR1. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they are effectively, they're, they're treated very similarly. Uh, and an experience, you know, the, the true clear cell carcinomas, uh, and I would tend to use, to some extent, and I, I may well be wrong in some cases, purely an anatomical localization to to call them whether something is odontogenic in origin or not. You know, and if you have a lesion that is a, essentially a clear cell carcinoma, which is within the jaws, which is above. You know, for example, in the mandible, above the inferior dental nerve, it's in the odontogenic portion of the alveolar bone, I would refer to it as an odont a clear cell odontogenic carcinoma. Uh, and you could argue, well, maybe some of them at the retromolar pad have come from salivary gland. But, you know, I, I think a lot of, for example, the mucoepidermoid carcinomas in that region are probably not coming from salivary gland tissue. They are just another example of the plasticity of odontogenic epithelium. Uh, and so that I, I would tend to call that. And, and the salivary ones, as we know, appear in the major and the minor glands, not particularly commonly, but we do, we do diagnose them. Okay, great. And uh, Merva, do you have any comments to add to this part? Uh, I, I have another question and challenge. I, I, I don't know if there is any cytocratin antibody to differentiate these two lesions, salivary gland, um, clear cell um, uh, carcinoma from salivary gland tissue from clear cell odontogenic carcinoma. I know uh, uh, regarding treatment plan, there is no significant difference between two uh, lesions, but um, um, uh, I think it, it, it is better to differentiate them because of academic, uh, uh, you know, viewpoints. Um, do, 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 Merva, do you have any comment about cytocratins or other antibodies might be helpful to differentiate these two clear cell tumors? Uh, that's a challenging topic, absolutely. I'm not sure if it is the uh, really uh, counterpart of the uh, 
introduces one for the salivary gland for the uh, odontogenic carcinoma. Uh, in many papers, we can see the CK19 is uh, special for the odontogenic epithelium, but in my experience, it's not. Most of the odontogenic epithelium sometimes show uh, negativity with the uh, cytokeratin 19. Uh, I, I, what about your experience about uh, cytokeratin 19? I don't know, but I have no uh, exact immunosystem chemistry to uh, distinguish between the uh, clear cells from the salivary gland tissue and the clear cells from the odontogenic epithelium. Uh, I think yeah, there my, is no immunosystem chemistry. Yeah, my my but, experience in, in the but cytokeratin 19 is pretty consistent in the benign odontogenic lesions, yeah. but is very, very unpredictable in malignant odontogenic tumors. Absolutely, 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 I agree. So I think uh, it's a little bit the academic uh, separation. Uh, maybe, I, I'm not sure, but the clear cell odontogenic carcinoma, uh, maybe a, a salivary gland uh, carcinoma like mucopidermoid carcinoma, uh, we know that the mucopidermoid carcinoma also arise from the jaws. Why not clear cell uh, salivary gland carcinoma arising from the jaw? Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but my, my counter to that would be that we know that um, adontogenic epithelium can undergo mucous metaplasia and does so quite significantly, <laughs> you know, is the fact that the mucoepidermoid carcinoma and the clear cell carcinomas are just demonstrating just how malleable, how plastic odontogenic epithelium is. Because I think odontogenic epithelium is the most fabulous tissue in the body. But I, you know, I'm just biased and a little bit odd in that regard. I, I think it's a, a fascinating uh, tissue. Uh, yes, that's the other side of the uh, wheel. Yeah, yes, absolutely agree. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, the last part uh, and the last pitfall of the article was about the carcinoma, carcinomas, amyloblastic carcinoma and other carcinoma of the jaws. You well explained about the importance of including all uh, microscopic uh, features, including mitotic features and also the, the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio and also invasion to the adjacent normal tissue. Um, do you have any comment, Professor Hunter, to add uh, how we can uh, make a diagnosis of odontogenic carcinoma of the jaw? So this is where you come to, I think, to one of my current pet topics. And we, there had been a paper um, from last year that um, Connie Marin and, and uh, Manis Dave and I published looking at the range of malignant odontogenic tumours within the in the literature over the last number of decades. And the thing that became very apparent in doing that review was that the quality of the literature in malignant odontogenic tumors is incredibly poor. And we didn't review in detail every case that had been reported. But my opinion in having spent time in all of that literature is that malignant odontogenic tumors have been significantly overdiagnosed. And I think that um, it's very important. It's, we, I think part of this comes from our rather poor categorization of ameloblastoma because ameloblastoma is a destructive tumor and it will, within the jaws, it will infiltrate into the cancella spaces of the bone, either in the mandible or the maxilla. But we do not call that a malignant tumor. Uh, and particularly in areas where the assessment of that and the clinical behavior is challenging. And I'm particularly talking about the maxilla in this case and the series that they have of maxillary amyloblastomas with quite a significant death rate from them. Now, it is an infiltrative destructive tumor. We call it benign, whether we want to eventually give it some sort of indication of it being an intermediate malignancy, that's a question for discussion for another day and probably something that we would argue over. But just because amyloblastoma on occasions kills patients does not mean that what we're looking at is a malignant tumor. It is a destructive tumor that if left to grow will end up at the skull base and will kill patients. So, but as far as calling it malignant is concerned and giving it the title of amyloblastic carcinoma or any of the other malignant tumors, 
I am looking for the classic features, cytological features of malignancy. So it's not, mitoses are often there, but they're insufficient of their own. We're looking for the features that you want to see, significant cytological atypia, and looking for necrosis, and looking for the classic features in order to call something. And just because a lesion happens to be destructive and the patient has significant morbidity or mortality of it does not mean that in and of itself that it is a malignant tumor. And I'm beginning to sound a little bit like uh, somebody who has gone crazy over this because I repeat myself over and over again, but I think it's incredibly important. And it's, it's, a, it's a case that it's a, an issue that Eddie O'Dell and I have discussed over many, many years, and we're in agreement about the significant overdiagnosis of that. And that is one of the reasons why we are we have started recently um, the development of an international odontogenic consortium of which MERVA is part to uh, try and bring together a number of experts from across the globe to drive up the quality of the reporting of cases and to bring together larger series so we can actually definitively tell you know, what features we're looking for, how these lesions are going to behave in particular circumstances. Um, so that's my opinion. It is not unif universally held, but that is my opinion of where we are at at the moment with malignant odontogenic tumors. Great, thank you. Merva, do you have any comment about this challenging topic? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The problem is that this um, odontogenic malignancy is extremely rare. And the, we haven't got any distinct uh, diagnostic criteria. That's the problem because of the variety. So uh, as the kid mentioned, we are uh, just uh, collecting these uh, extreme cases to make the, uh, the criteria uh, to make the exact diagnosis. But for the um, amyloblastic carcinoma, just uh, for my experience, as the kid also said that, I just look at the uh, cytological malignancy. Uh, there should be no doubt that they are the malignant uh, cells. So, which I uh, look at uh, for diagnosis of omeloblastic carcinoma. Other carcinomas of odontogenic carcinomas, a little bit different, uh, maybe another uh, discussion topic, but for the uh, omeloblastic carcinoma, we should see the, uh, the distinct uh, cytologic mal malignancy. So I would agree, but going back to the clear cell odontogenic carcinoma, you don't always see cytological features of malignancy in that, but you see the other features that allow you to make the diagnosis. So it's everything is contextualized in, in relation to the individual diagnosis. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Time is up and let me um, um, wrap up this um, journal club with a sentence of the invaluable article that uh, be very cautious in making diagnosis of odontogenic tumor in a patient whose uh, dentition is uh, still developing. And also I would like to add another take home message uh, for the audience that assessment of malignancy in destructive odontogenic lesions is very challenging and the specimen should be widely sampled. Uh, with the assessment of proliferation as a useful aid in the overall consideration of the malignancy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hunter, Professor Merva, and also uh, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Mahdavi, Dr. Mahsa for joining us. Uh, uh, here you are, this uh, certificate of uh, the uh, contribution Professor Hunter, it was a great honor for us to have you in this uh, program. And also I would like to thank uh, next sir, Dr. Mahdavi for, and also Dr. Mahdavi for um, contribution to this program. And also the next one, Dr. Mahsa for uh, her uh, valuable presentation. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Merva here to uh, join us for the next journal club. I know that she has published a very uh, invaluable um, article recently focusing on new changes of the uh, odontogenic classification in uh, WHO Blue Book 2022. And uh, I will negotiate with you about uh, 
to have you for the next um, uh, journal club. How can I say no in this platform now? <laughs> of course, my pleasure. Very kind of you. Very kind <laughs> my of pleasure. That would be my pleasure. Very kind of you. And I would like to express my sincere appreciation again to all of audience, especially Professor Hunter, and hope to meet you again. Uh, I, I would like to ask you to turn on your uh, webcam to have a uh, group photo at the end of this meeting. Could you please turn on your video? Uh, my, I think my video is on. Yes, yes. And all audience. Sure, Nandini, thank you, thank you. And it's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Safpar. Thank you for being with us in this. I thank you, thank you. Okay, great, great. And thank you for being with us for this panel and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Puyan, thank you all. Have a nice day. Welcome. Thank you very much. Bye.